year 12 students welcome back to remote learning we said that it was a chance of happening and clearly it has happened i hope that you are staying safe and well and um, adhering to the stage four restrictions of only leaving your house for a very short period of time within your five kilometer radius obviously we were going to be doing prac yesterday yesterday became a student free day today we're back into it i'm going to deliver to you through this video some content I'm going to recap what we were talking about last week in class and give a little bit more detail around those areas and then I'm going to move on to a couple of new areas. We are talking about the, the principles that underpin a good effective training program for athletes and then we're going to have a bit of a zoom and, and have a discussion around how do we want to move forward with our planning of our lessons. Um, I need feedback from you so start thinking about providing me with both positive and negative feedback from, from last time we were in remote learning and what you need. At this stage it clearly looks like your next sack is going to be completed um, remotely which means that you will be writing that training program um, based off of a case study that Mr. Smith and I will provide you um, and that training program will be written in a 75 minute sack or 65 minutes whatever we decide the, the length of that time will be um, and then submit it online. So back into that process and I know for some students last time that was an effective process and for others there were some struggles so we need to work through that so everyone can get the best outcome they possibly can. So let's get straight into it and just remember that through the textbook, we're going through um, a series of principles and if you want the training program to be effective, um, to avoid injury and overtraining like I mentioned and to also experience the chronic adaptations, the improvements, the changes long term in your body, then each of the principles that underpin an effective training program need to be met. And so we're working our way through these principles here. So what I've done is I've been just simply through the textbook and I've just started to summarize and take down a few little notes that I wanted to share with you. So the training program needs to be individualized. That means that we look at the strengths and weaknesses of a, an athlete and the needs of their sport and we cater the training program for that athlete for their sport. So the frequency we spoke about um, in order for a um, a fitness component or component of fitness to be effectively trained and adapted and improved needs to be three times per week. We talked about in class as well the catabolic versus the anabolic effect. So as the athlete is training and their body begins to break down, which I know we've discussed in detail through the weights room sessions, etc., if we want that catabolic effect, the breakdown of the muscles and, and, and the body and its organs and its effectiveness to happen, we need to train in the right zone at the right period of time for the right duration. And then we need to give the athlete time to rest so the anabolic effect can, can take place. Because if we give that anabolic effect its time to rest, recover and recuperate and improve, the athlete will get those chronic adaptations, long-term changes, the effectiveness. So we talked about splitting our routine. So you can superset, you can do um, you know, a session on a Monday and then another session on a Tuesday that focuses on a different body part. So the rest for the upper body that was completed on Monday is resting Tuesday while the lower body is working on Tuesday and therefore resting the next day. And alternating those means that you don't need a rest day, you can rest certain parts of the body on, on given days. This works better for those trained elite athletes than it does for an untrained individual. But a lot of writing specific training programs is around those higher level athletes. So this is something we need to take into consideration. We also need to work training programs around people's schedule, their work, their individual commitments, and make sure that it's not too much for an athlete. It's not too much for them to be able to complete the program because if it is achievable, then the adaptations will take place because the athlete will go to each session, give their all to each session, and have the outcomes. So, <clears throat> Sometimes we also need to um, think about maybe not even just one session per day because elite athletes are capable of training morning and afternoon, multiple sessions per day. And so really thinking about not just seven sessions because we have seven days of the week, but however many sessions is required. And can those sessions be recovery sessions as well by going for a light jog, which is something that we discussed during the fatigue and recovery chapter. If we can do that, we're able to do it because elite athletes will experience less of that catabolic effect 
than untrained athletes. Their body won't break down as much because it's it's already been through those breakdowns and they really need to push fairly, diff, fairly hard to be able to get the catabolic effect. Okay, now in terms of intensity, I know that we spoke about intensity matching energy systems, but the intensity also needs to match the muscles that are being used or the muscle groups and the same movements that are being used. There's not a huge amount of, of um, point in a cyclist training rowing multiple times per week. All that upper body work for the cyclist is going to be experiencing different muscular contractions and different fitness components than what their actual cycling would endure. Now, that's not saying that we can't cross train a cyclist, but if we were to focus on doing rowing multiple times per week, it's not gonna be as effective because we're not targeting the same muscle groups, fitness components and movements as what that cyclist requires in their sport. So when we say intensity, we're talking about what is the level of exertion that an athlete is actually um, outputting during a session or during a bout within that session. And generally speaking, if we increase the intensity that an athlete is training at, we would decrease the duration or, or the time in which that session is taking place. So the higher the intensity, the shorter the duration in a bout or a training exercise session. When we are training aerobically, because the sport in which we're competing in is an aerobic based sport based on the data analysis, the activity analysis that takes place and the needs and requirements of that sport, then we would be trying to map out things like our heart rate or our VO2 and our VO2 max and the percentage in which we are training towards our VO2 max or heart rate. The problem is, is that when we're training anaerobically, because the needs of our sport is an anaerobic sport, there's a lag in, in when we measure our heart rate and when we get the resultant of what that heart rate is in comparison to what the body is requiring. So think about this. If I'm going for a jog and my heart rate is sitting around about 120, 130 beats per minute, and then all of a sudden I need to cross the road and I can see there's a car coming in the distance, so I need to speed up to cross that road. The distance in which I'm gonna sprint or speed up is quite short. It's two lanes of a, of a road. And so I sprint across those that, that quick portion of road. I wanna do it as quickly as possible for safety reasons to get to the other side. But the problem is, is that if I look down at my heart rate, during that sprint or even very quickly after that sprint, my heart rate may not have gone up very much from where it was sitting. It might, a few steps later, peak a little bit and then go back to my steady state, if at all, because there is a lag in actually getting the heart to start pumping a little bit faster. And for that to actually be read on a heart rate monitor or even measured, the lag doesn't actually show the exact timing of an increase in intensity. It does generally show when it's mapped different spikes like we've seen in the futsal data, for example, but it's not up to date as it happens and it's not easy to map and track anaerobic contributions using heart rate as easy as it is to map aerobic contributions. So we might use something like the RPE, rate of perceived exertion. And I'll just flip over and I'll show you this now from the textbook. When we look at heart rate, we know all the heart rate zones, etc. But when we look at rate of perceived exertion, we're looking here at a 10 point scale, which was um, created by Borg, the Borg CR category ratio scale. So if we were to give a zero rating, there is no exertion at all. This person is sitting on the sidelines or standing there. If we were to give a rating of one out of 10, it would deem very light exercise. A three out of 10, moderate. No problem continuing with this for a very long period of time. A five out of 10, it's pretty heavy, okay? Um, you're tired, but I could continue. I just know that I'm gonna be pretty fatigued afterwards. Seven out of 10, very strenuous. I'm pushing myself. I can continue, but I'm pushing myself. A 10 out of 10, maximum. Totally extreme strenuous, probably the most strenuous I've ever done. It's the 100 meter sprint. It is pushing. I'm almost going to collapse at the end of this session here. So when we look at these zones and the training zones and the rates in which this person is actually training, 
we're looking at the 220 minus your age if we're looking at heart rate, okay? And the prediction of those maximum heart rates and those percentage of maximum heart rates is something in which we can um, work with. So as I said before, you can look at your VO2 max, you can look at, excuse me, your rate of perceived exertion or the maximum heart rate percentage and train at the zone in which it's required. What we need to understand though is that a trained athlete will have a higher lactate inflection point. So the trained athlete in that lactate inflection point zone might be at 91 or 92% of their maximum heart rate. However, those trained athletes will know where their lactate inflection point is because after they've trained at a certain intensity for a certain period of time and they start to experience real fatigue mechanisms due to the buildup of lactic acid, they know that's the intensity I can train at before I've hit my lactate inflection point. So some training sessions you want to train at the lactate inflection point, some underneath and some above. But each of these training zones must be stuck to if we want to see a change for an elite athlete or any athlete for that matter. Now I want to very quickly talk about time or duration and then periodization and then finally into the type of training. So we're continuing on with these different principles that underpin a training program. Now when we say time, we're actually referring to the duration, okay? And it's the duration of three different things. Firstly, it's the duration of your program. So it might be a six week program, a 12 month program, a 20 week program. And you might have seen at different gymnasiums, 10 week program, and you get your results at the end of your 10 weeks. We deem six weeks to be the time in which a program needs to be administered in order to experience chronic adaptations for the fitness components and for the energy systems and for the needs and requirements of that sport. When we say time or duration, we also refer to how long does an individual training session go for. So it might be a half an hour session a one hour session. That is the time or duration of that individual session. What we say though, is that we can also talk about the length of time or duration that the work is being completed during a session. So an individual bout, a particular run consistently or a sprint bout within a training session. We can refer to time and duration in that. And one thing under time that we need to understand and commit to memory is that you need to be working for 20 minutes aerobically to be able to achieve aerobic adaptations for an athlete. So I'm not saying do a 20 minute session where there's the five minute warm up, the five minute cool down and only 10 minutes of work in there. We need to actually have 20 minutes of committed working time or duration in the aerobic system to get any chronic adaptations. The next section I wanted to talk about was periodization. So periodization is actually just referring to the structure of a training session. So when I design a training program, sorry, not session, I should have said program. When I design a program, six week, 12 month, whatever it might be, I need to make sure that I keep periodization in mind as one of the principles in designing a program. We need to look at different manageable blocks for athletes and blocks that have a different focus on their training. This can actually really help with setting goals and achieving goals. So if I say to an athlete, I'm gonna write a 12 month training program for you, and that athlete looks at 12 months worth of program, the motivation levels will go down, the consistency of their dedication to their practice will go down. What we actually need is for that athlete to commit to the entire program. And if the program is manageable and it's been, um, periodization is in mind where it's different segments and focuses have been put in place, for these eight weeks, you will focus on this. For the next six weeks, you will focus on this. It's easier for that athlete to get through eight weeks and six weeks than it is an entire 12 month program. So two things that we'd keep in mind when we are periodization, um, designing a, a training program is tapering and peaking. So tapering refers to unloading or bringing back the intensity, the, the, the volume of training, but not the intensity. So when we taper for an athlete, instead of three days per week, they might go down to two days per week. 
Instead of 45 minute session, they might go down to 20 minute session, but the intensity in which that athlete is training needs to remain constant and in the zones in which they will compete for their sport or they are training for their benefits. So that's tapering is backing things off a little bit, but peaking is, is goes hand in hand with tapering because as we taper and we bring down the volume of training, the athlete will no longer suffer from any of those fatiguing mechanisms that are taking place because of multiple training sessions per week and the body going through its catabolic changes. What we'll actually have is a lack of fatigue and therefore give the body time to have those anabolic effects and remove any of that chronic fatigue, any of those lingering issues, so that the athlete can peak and have high performance at the right time. So if we taper at the right time of a program, so we peak at the right time of a program, we are actually able to make sure that athlete is going to be performing at their absolute best and have the chronic adaptations take place. An example of, of um, periodization with tapering and peaking might be AFL. So there's the pre-season, there's the competition phase, and then there's the off-season. During the pre-season, we are loading that athlete up. At the end of the pre-season, going into the competition, we would be tapering off. We would have some sort of maintenance program throughout the competition phase. And if that athlete and their team make finals, then we would really taper things off so that they're peaking right at the correct time. We look at some of the AFL teams that aren't doing very well during the start of the season and they really peak and perform well at the end of the season and into finals. That is a really good um, example of periodization of their training programs. The final thing that I'll touch on quickly are the types of training. And this is where a big chunk of our time moving forward is gonna be spent. Now there are three different types of training. There is aerobic training, anaerobic training, and flexibility training. And each of these categories in these flow charts are different training types that we need to commit to memory. There's a few things we need to be careful of, and I'm gonna talk about high intensity um, interval training. I'm gonna talk about fart leg training. I need to talk a lot about plyometrics and the different types of intervals, long, short, intermediate intervals, so that we know when we are designing a training program for a case study or a given athlete that we are making sure that we're focusing on whether it be aerobic, anaerobic, or flexibility needs of that athlete. Hopefully throughout today's video, you've managed to get some really good information. Pause, write down your notes, continue re-watching this as we head towards the SAC if you want anything clarified. We're gonna join Zoom towards the end of this lesson and have a little bit of a chat about moving forward. Make sure you've read the lesson plan on Compass to see any work that you need to have completed as well. See you soon.